Hi guys, so today's topic is classification of diseases and conditions affecting the periodontium. A broad overview of all the topics we're going to be covering are gingival diseases, periodontal diseases, and necrotizing diseases. The first being gingival diseases. Gingival diseases are broadly classified as either plaque-induced or non-plaque-induced. If you talk about plaque-induced uh, ones, they are further subclassified as those due to dental plaque only, and that's quite self-explanatory that they are only due to the presence of dental plaque. So the main cause is dental plaque, a large accumulation of dental plaque. Then we have those um, modified by systemic factors. There are two things. Digital disease can either be modified by systemic factors or they can be a, a manifestation of systemic factors. And in this case, we have those modified by systemic factors, which means that your dental plaque is the predominant cause of your gingivitis and it's being enhanced. The destructive ability of plaque is being enhanced due to the presence of your systemic factor. These systemic factors are commonly puberty, menstrual, menstrual the menstrual cycle, pregnancy, and diabetes mellitus, or it could also be those associated with blood disorders. Blood disorders include leukemia, iron deficiency anemia, and stuff of the sort. The most common cause of gingival disease modified by systemic factor is diabetes mellitus, and if we're talking about pregnancy associated, you will often find a pyogenic granuloma. A pyogenic granuloma is a purplish, dark red, discrete swelling present on the gingiva in the second trimester and it will, it's, it's self healing, it will go away itself after your pregnancy is over. Then we have those modified by medications. Um, there are three sorts, there are three classes of drugs that cause gingival disease. Those include anticonvulsant drugs, which has phenytoin, immunosuppressive drugs such as cyclosporine, calcium channel blockers, which include neftabine, verapamil, diltezem, and sodium valparate. Then we have those modified by malnutrition, um, in which we have vitamin C deficiency, also known as ascorbic acid deficiency, which causes scurvy. And it could also be a childhood malnutrition, which could lead to cankerum oris, which is also known as NOMA. After this, we have um, non-plaque induced gingival diseases, which, in, which, are far, which are further subclassified as those of bacterial origin, viral origin, fungal origin, genetic, systemic, or allergic. The first being bacterial. So in bacteria, uh, the most common bacteria that causes gingival diseases are Trypanum pallidum, which causes syphilis. The most common viral um, virus is herpes simplex virus, which causes gingival stomatitis. It can also cause oral herpes, recurrent oral herpes. Um, then we have those of fungal origin in which we have candida species. And um, so candida causes thrush and it also causes other, you know, all these candidal related gingival diseases, they're, they're discussed in oral path. And then we have those of genetic origin in which we have gingival fibromatosis, which you also will cover in oral path. Um, gingival, dis um, gingival diseases and manifestation of systemic conditions. Like I said before, we have those modified by systemic conditions and those as a manifestation of systemic conditions. When we talk about those as a manifestation of systemic conditions, your systemic conditions is the predominant cause of your gingivitis or gingival disease, whatever it may be. Um, and you, you more often than, yeah, so you more often than not will not find any plaque in the oral cavity of the patient. So it's a clean mouth, but a systemic condition is present, which is why the patient has a gingival disease. So these systemic conditions can be lichen planus, pemphigoid, pemphigus vulgaris, erythema multiforme, or lupus erythematosus. The most common one being benign mucous membrane pemphigoid, which is an example of non-plaque non induced gingival disease without socioeconomic implications. Um, then we have allergic reactions in which the most common one is mercury and amalgam. It can also be due, actually mercury and amalgam are in fillings, whereas if we talk about an overall restorer material, we have acrylic being you know, your crowns, your dental crowns and implants are commonly made of acrylic, so this could cause a gingival allergic reaction. Um, people can also be allergic to toothpaste or mouth rinses, also bubble gums and other food additives. Then we have traumatic lesions. Traumatic lesions are, um, okay, so traumatic lesions can either be chemical, physical, or thermal. If we talk about physical ones, they can either be factitious or iatrogenic. Um, they, they may also be accidental, which are obviously caused by accident. If we talk about the iatrogenic ones, these are caused by the practitioner, which in this case is the dentist. So the dentist will accidentally cause any sort of 
it's mostly a thermal injury that the dentist causes, but it can also be any sort of physical injury. So if a dentist causes a physical injury during the procedure, that's an iatrogenic traumatic lesion. If the person causes it, um, an accidental injury, such as due to nail biting or, um, I don't know, but the common one is nail biting. So that would be factitious. Then we have chemical injuries, which are commonly due to aspirin burns. And then we have thermal injuries, which are which can be due to burrs during a dental procedure, or they can be due to, you know, while you're scaling, you have water being ejected out the instrument. So if you don't have enough water, or like if you don't have adequate amount of water, or if you don't have any water at all, this would cause a thermal injury to the patient. Other foreign body reactions can also cause um, gingival diseases. The next topic we have is periodontitis. Periodontitis is defined as an inflammatory disease of supporting tissues that is usually caused by microorganisms that results in progressive destruction of periodontal ligament and alveolar bone and increases the probing depth, recession, and or both. Um, the clinical features that distinguish periodontitis from gingivitis is the presence of clinically detectable attachment loss. This is really important to remember. And gingivitis will also not have a periodontal pocket formation, whereas periodontitis will. Um, all right, so now periodontitis can be broadly classified into early or adult. It can also be classified as chronic aggressive, and it can also be classified as localized or generalized. The first one we have is early or adult. So in early periodontitis, it's aggressive. Your age is less than 35 years old, and there is a defect in the host defenses. This can usually be due to prepubertal or juvenile, and it presents as rapidly progressing periodontitis. Um, a defect in the host defenses means that there is a systemic condition present or the patient's immunocompromised, such as diabetes, mellitus, or any other cause, which would lead to you being immunocompromised. In adult periodontitis, this is slowly progressive. Your age is more often than not more than 35 years old and there is no defect in the host response meaning that the patient is healthy but he's old and the it has and then there's a third type which is necrotizing forms um which you don't really need to know about right now at least um the next one we have is chronic or aggressive chronic periodontitis is usually common is a more common one it's prevalent in adults and you have systemic factors such as plague present in the mouth. So this is important to remember because in aggressive periodontitis, you don't have local factors. Whereas in chronic periodontitis, you do have local factors such as plague. Um, subgingival calculus is usually found here, where is, whereas in aggressive, you don't have subgingival calculus being present. And then we have um, the chronic one, no, the aggressive one. Yeah, then we have the aggressive one in which you have the patient is otherwise healthy. He doesn't have any other, um, you, you know, systemic disease. And he also has no local factors. So it's not consistent with local factors. And there is rapid attachment loss and rapid bone destruction because, and another difference in between these two is that chronic periodontitis had horizontal bone loss, whereas aggressive periodontitis has vertical bone loss, which leads to an arc-shaped defect being formed. Um, and that is about it. Also, the common bacteria that's found in aggressive periodontitis is actinobacillus actinomycetocomitans. And another thing that was important is that to treat aggressive periodontitis, you need to give systemic antibiotics such as tetracycline, whereas in chronic periodontitis, you don't give systemic antibiotics. Then we have um, localized or generalized periodontitis. Localized forms include less than 30% of the total dentition, and um, the sites involved are the first molars and incisors, with attachment loss on two other permanent teeth, including one, one of those two being a first molar. Whereas in generalized forms, it includes more than 30% of your dentition. Um, and generalized forms is more often than not found in patients who are more less than 30 years old and it involves three teeth other than the first molars and incisors. That was all here. Periodontitis is a manifestation of systemic diseases. We discussed this earlier as well. When it's a manifestation of systemic disease, in that case, your 
Systemic disease is a major predisposing factor and the local factors such as play calculus are not evident. So um, factors that can cause these sort of situations are hematological disorders and which include neutropenia, leukemias, and iron deficiency anemias. After this, we have um, other things that can cause systemic diseases. Any other systemic diseases are that can cause gingivitis are these. I should papillon, Lefebvre syndrome. This is kind of important because you'll study about this in oral path. What this causes is um, hand, hand and mouth, no, hand and foot. It has um, hand and foot implications. I don't exactly remember what those implications were, but it has hand and foot implications. Um, developmental, yeah, I skipped that. I don't even know why I included this here. Okay, occlusal trauma. So there are two types of occlusal trauma. It can either be primary occlusal trauma or it can be secondary occlusal trauma. And if it's primary occlusal trauma, we have a whole chapter on tra um, trauma from occlusion, which you will study in more detail. So over here, I'm just giving you a brief overview about this. So in primary occlusal trauma, you have um, a trauma from occlusion due to a high filling, a, a high restoration, or any other foreign body being present or uh, biting on some hard surface. So this is stuff that in your, the patient is healthy, normal, has a normal oral cavity, but it's due to other outside factors that cause the primary occlusal trauma. Whereas secondary occlusal trauma is due to, it's usually due to old age or, you know, in any person who has a higher amount of bone loss. And that's where a patient, you will have secondary occlusal trauma because his mouth, his oral cavity cannot withstand the forces of the occlusal, cannot withstand the occlusal forces. Whereas in primary occlusal trauma, they can actually withstand it. It's just that the patient has a high filling or has chewed on something that's really hard. Refractory periodontitis is the periodontitis that doesn't go away even after you start taking antibiotics. Um, so you're taking, you have supportive and conventional therapy going on, but your periodontitis progresses. It does not regress. That's known as refra refractory periodontitis. Then we have periodontitis associated with endodontic lesions. Um, right. Okay. So there are two, sort of, there is a whole chapter on this as well. Um, there are two lesions. They can either be endoperio lesions or perioendo lesions. Endoperio lesions are also known as, um, Mm, orthograde? No, uh, sorry. Endoperio lesions are known as retrograde lesions in which you the primary cause is endo and it leads to a perio cause. Um, an example of this is that you have pulpitis and do and the pulpitis it uh, it leads to gingivitis. How it leads to gingivitis is that the the infection from the pulp it travels through your apical foramen, your accessory canals, or it could also travel through your dentinal tubules and it gets into the PDL and your other supporting structures, and so it causes um, gingivitis. The treatment for this would be an RCT or a primary endo treatment. So endoperio is known as retrograde periodontitis, and then we have perioendo lesions, which, are, which start from a periodontal pocket. The infection travels from your pocket to into your pulp chamber. Through, again, through your apical foramen, through dental mill tubules, or through the accessory canals. This is known as orthrograde periodontitis. So it can be retrograde or it can be orthograde. And treatment for orthrograde would be um, scaling, root planing, and drainage. Then you could have a mix, a combined lesion, which is um, at the same rate it's being retrograde at the same rate as being orthograde, in which case you will also have RCTs and you also have drainage, scaling, and root planing. The next topic we have is a periodontal abscess. Um, periodontal abscess are swellings associated with a periodontal pocket and they form above the attached gingiva. That's what you need to know here. Then we have acute necrotizing periodontitis, in which case um, the patient is immunocompromised and most probably has HIV. There is severe bone loss and, sorry. So there is severe bone loss and the tooth support, yes, there's just severe bone loss here and it can lead to noma if the patient is also um, malnourished, which usually happens in African patients. That's all in this chapter. I really hope you guys understood. Let me know if you didn't.